Ricky. Hey everyone, welcome to ScrapeCon 2024. Today we're going to talk about mastering browser interactions for scrapers. Before we get started, a quick intro. My name is Aviv. I'm a director of proxy and scraping products at Bright Data. And with me today is Ilya Kolker, post sales specialist. Me and Ilya have been working together for a long time in Bright Data. We've built and shipped products. We've solved different challenges. And hopefully, we can share some of that insight today with you. Now, before we get started, a quick intro about the flow of modern web uh, data collection pipeline. It's becoming complex. Uh, it's a multi-stage process. And the main parts of it, which are probably relevant for most of you, are uh, exploration, finding the data sources, doing the uh, initial crawling, using proxies, getting the raw HTML, then doing the initial processing, parsing the data, uh, doing some validation, then maybe some uh, additional enrichment or uh, last processing, and finally using it for your internal needs or for your uh, external customers and so on. And at the same time, you'll be constantly monitoring uh, the performance. You'll be making sure you comply with different regulations, internal or external. And you'll be making sure your scrape ops are uh, taking as they should be. Probably a good example for that would be some uh, e-commerce company, a very popular use case. They need to uh, scrape information about their competitors, or they need to reprice their products automatically. So they go and scrape uh, product information, like uh, product prices, shipping times, shipping fees, product, product descriptions, and so on. Then they have the raw HTML. They process it into a JSON. They validate it. They might enrich it with some more information. And finally, store it and then use it internally for repricing, for example. OK, I want to talk quickly about dynamic scraping as a layered process. There's different parts to the scraping, and uh, especially when working with browsers and dynamic scraping, we'll start with uh, the core capabilities involving browsers. When you're doing dynamic scraping, to the very minimum, you need to do rendering of the site, loading the site with a browser. And usually, you'll also need to perform all kinds of actions with a browser, like scrolling, clicking, loading JS-heavy sites, AJAX calls, and so on. Then you need to make sure that you manage to adjust your uh, browsers and your scripts to the many changes happening more and more and quicker and quicker with the different target sites. Then we get to the blocking part. It's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge to scrape publicly available information. Uh, information sits behind CAPTCHAs, fingerprint mechanisms, uh, and so on. But starting with the basics, there's the regular mechanisms like IP bans and rate limiting. Websites want to make sure uh, any given IP doesn't scrape them too much, doesn't make too many requests. They might block it. They might ban the IP. Uh, they might block the entire range. So you need to make sure uh, you notice that. And then we have the more advanced techniques, which we started talking about, the CAPTCHAs, the fingerprint. And that's something that needs to be maintained. Uh, and it's a big uh, focus in a good scraping operation. Finally, we have the browser infrastructure. So first, we need the browsers themselves. You need to have servers. You need to install the browsers on them. And you need to make sure about all the nitty gritty stuff, like making sure the Chrome version is up to date, and so on. The auto scaling is in place in case you have usage peaks. And you need to make sure the browser fingerprint is high quality. So it mimics a real user, and you don't get blocked. Now, when looking at a, a scraping operation, generally, there's a few things you're looking at and aiming to get. The first one is minimizing proxy and unlocking maintenance. This is probably the most important point, because you want a reliable system. Even if you manage to get things done on your own, if every time there's a blocking uh, from some site, you find yourself down for weeks, that's a problem. And it means you can't trust your system to be a constant data pipeline. So this is an important point. Then you have compatibility with mainstream tools, uh, protocols, or libraries. In the case of uh, scraping dynamic sites and using browsers, 
If you're using external tools, you want to make sure they support the libraries you're probably using, like Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium, or any of their spin-offs. We have optimizing resource utilization to minimize cost and downtime. Basically saying you want to be able to get more with less. Get all the data you need, but not having to spend too much uh, R&D time or budgets uh, on the things related to it. And finally, making sure whatever system you're using, in-house or external, uh, meets the needs of your scale. That you can process in parallel as many sessions as you need, and that you can spike as, as uh, uh, big as you need with the browsers. In this context, I want to present the Scraping Browser. It's our newest product, growing very fast and bringing huge value to our customers. Basically, the Scraping Browser is our answer to all the needs I raised uh, in the previous slides. It's a remote browser infrastructure, which you connect to. Uh, very similar to how you would connect to a local browser, only in this case, you add your credentials. And then from that point on, you can use your uh, regular scripts uh, interacting with the browser. Now, the Scraping Browser is not an ordinary browser. It has built-in proxies and unblocking. So that means all the different challenges we talked about, cookie management, IPs cool down, headers, protocols, the fingerprint of the browser, everything is included and built into the Scraping Browser. It will do it in the background. From your point of view, all you need to do is interact with the, with the browser, and all the heavy lifting is done by us in the background. Now, I want to address this product, the Scraping Browser, in the context of the different points we discussed earlier. In terms of minimizing proxy and unlocking maintenance, basically, your maintenance of these things is now zero. It's all taken care of by this product. You don't have to worry about it. In terms of compatibility with the top libraries for uh, interacting with a browser, uh, Scraping Browser is fully compatible with Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium, and any of the spin-offs uh, for different languages, so that means Integration is super easy. Uh, you have your existing code, just connect to the product, literally plug and play. Then we have optimizing resources. With the Scraping Browser, the system is fully optimized. You just need to send uh, your scripts to it, connect to your browser, and then we optimize the processes in the background. You don't need to worry about that. In terms of scale, the Scraping Browser has been an internal product way before it was an external product that we uh, shipped to our customers. It was used by a full stack of products, it's a huge system running a huge amount of traffic through it, and it's already mature and robust. You will not hit the ceiling of its scale. So we talked about the Scraping Browser. Uh, let's take a quick case study that to show you how it interacts with one of our real customers. This specific customer has an app where users can find coupon codes and use them. In order to make that app work, they need to collect these coupon codes and make sure they're valid and up to date. So what they need to do is go to the different sites, input the coupon code, and make sure that the process is a valid process. And obviously, this means interacting with the target site and using a browser. The way they did it before is by an in-house solution where they had browsers with 16 gigabyte RAM, eight core servers, uh, they ran up to 100 parallel browsers or sessions at a given moment. They used residential proxies uh, and ran about one terabyte per month. Their R&D handled any unblocking challenges, challenges in-house. Uh, and It was a big headache for them, and they spent significant resources on it. Now, in terms of cost, R&D cost about 4,500. The residential proxies cost about the same amount. And for infrastructure, servers, CAPTCHAs, they spent an additional $1,000 a month. All that comes to $10,000 a month, which is a big expense for their usage. Now, if comparing it to the Scraping Browser and actually simulating for their usage and their use case, what would be the price? We came to a price of $5,000 a month. That's half of the previous expense. Plus, it has minimal maintenance. They don't need to worry about the, the blocking challenges and all that. They have peace of mind that they have a reliable system that just works when they need it. OK, great. So we talked about the Scraping Browser. Now it's time to see the Scraping Browser in action. So I want to hand it over to Ilya to do a quick demo and show you how it works. Ilya, take it from here, please. Thank you, Aviv. In this section, I'll be showing you 
how you can interact with our remote browsers utilizing the scraping browser tool. I'll show you how you can type search terms in search area, how you can click keyboard and retrieve data and eventually parse it, taking screenshots as well. I'll also show you a bit advanced technique of how you can get data from a mobile uh, browser using uh, almost the same code. And eventually I'll show you how you can inspect and debug your code using our debugger tool in our control panel. So I'll show you how you can go to amazon.com, click on search area, type laptop, click enter, get the data and parse it. I'll also show you this, how you can uh, view the mobile options and eventually how you can inspect it from our control panel. Let's start with the code. I'll be using Puppeteer for this demo and Cheerio for parsing. I'll connect to our remote browser using the connect method. I'll go to the home page, wait for the selectors, type the search term that I want, click the keyboard, load the data, and eventually parse it. Let's run the code. So now I'm connected to the browser. Navigate to the home page. Eventually I parsed the data and took a screenshot. This is what we see. Now let's go back to the code and see what we need to do in order to get mobile device data. So Puppeteer has the option to add custom headers. And in this section, it's called set extra HTTP headers. So to get data from a mobile device browser, I'll be setting a user agent from Android device. Save the code and then run it. I should get a screenshot eventually of a browser from a mobile browser look like. Connected to the browser. Navigated to the home page. Got the data, parsed it. And eventually I took a screenshot and now we can see what we got. We got a mobile lookalike browser. We can see it from the search area and how they show your location and all the products. Why we see it like that and not an exact mobile? This is the reason. If we go and close the dev tools, it will be stretched. So this is what we got. Now we want to see how it looks in real, in real time and how we can debug the code and see how we can uh, use our control panel to get uh, to the browser itself. Let's go to the code, close the screenshot. And for this example, I'll not be using the mobile user agent. What I need to do is 
to set a CDP session and get an inspect ID. So it's Chrome DevTools protocol in order to get to uh, the remote browser and see uh, it's in action. And we will get a, an inspect ID and I'll show you where uh, how you can uh, use it. So let's save the code and then run it. Now we can go to our control panel, get the session ID, which you can see also in the code, there it is. We can click on it. It will open the DevTools and the, and the remote browser in our local browser, so we can see the actions happening in real time. We can see all the requests of the browser going through, how we automatically type, click, navigate to the second page, getting the results, taking a screenshot, parsing the data and closing the browser. Here is, a, here is our parse data. Thank you for uh, watching and see you in the next section. Okay, Ilya, that was great. Thanks a lot for this demo. Hopefully it managed to communicate the great value of the scraping browser. Now, I wanna give a few key takeaways to summarize everything we talked about until this point. First, Dynamic scraping at scale is complex and costly. We need to find ways to optimize it, and the products we offer try to minimize the cost, the effort, and give you a reliable tool. Second, the scraping browser has basically all these needs built into it. It has the proxies, it has the unblocking, it has the auto-scaling, it's a one-stop shop, one interface, including all these capabilities. And finally, and not less important, integration with the scraping browser is super easy. And from my experience with customers, this is super important. It means that you can just connect it with your existing scripts, probably using the mainstream libraries, and it's just plug and play, literally no preparation needed. Okay, thanks everyone. We got to the end of our session. I hope you had a good time, and I hope you got some insights from it. Anyone who wants to write to me and give me some feedback, uh, you had my email in the first slide. It's avivb at brightdata.com. I'll be very happy to get your feedback. And I urge you to contact your account managers and ask for a free trial with the Scraping Browser. Use the product for yourself, see how it works, and then you can decide if you want to work with it. That's it. Thank you, everyone.